By the turn of the 20th century, Italian opera composer Giacomo Puccini had introduced the opera world to La Boheme and Tosca, and he took that world by storm. But the question that must have been in his mind at this point was what was going to be the source of inspiration for his next opera? He was frantic to find something because, above all, inactivity was something that was a frightful prospect to him. Then, on a trip to London, Puccini saw a play that immediately seized his imagination. The plight of the young, simple heroine at odds with her family and her culture because of her love of a young foreigner, her three-year vigil waiting for his return and her eventual suicide. All of these were the kinds of story elements that Puccini demanded in his operas. The drama touched him in a way that nothing had previously done. The heroine was, of course, Chocho-san, the geisha who falls in love with an American naval officer and who eventually renounces everything, even her life, for him. The opera, Madama Butterfly. I'm Nick Ravellis, and this is Opera Talk. After the success of the first performance of Tosca in Rome in January 1900, Puccini went to Milan to begin preparations for the opera's premiere at La Scala in March, and then to London to be there for Tosca's first performances at Covent Garden. While there, he attended a performance at the Duke of York Theatre, a double bill including a play called Miss Nobbs by Jerome K. Jerome, and a new play by an American playwright, David Belasco, entitled Madam Butterfly, taken from a short story by John Luther Long. David Belasco was an actor-playwright of Jewish-Portuguese ancestry who exerted quite an influence on the American stage. He was given to lavish productions, exquisite lighting effects, and a realistic style of acting not often seen in theaters of the day. Emotion in drama was what Belasco looked for more than anything, so we can easily see why Long's story of Madame Butterfly was something that he wanted to put on the stage. According to the playwright Belasco, Puccini came up to him after the London performance, weeping inconsolably and demanding to have the operatic rights to his play. Well, certainly Puccini was struck by the theatricality of the work. And we find that by March 1901, a little less than a year after viewing the Belasco play, Puccini was enthusiastically drumming up support for his latest project. He sent an Italian translation of the original story to his librettist, Luigi Illica, who had collaborated with him on both Bohème and Tosca. Illica was responsible for the scenario, for fashioning a compelling dramatic through line from the original material that would make sense on the operatic stage. It was the other librettist, Giuseppe Giacosa, however, who was responsible for the poetry, for the versification. Giacosa was a meticulous wordsmith who had given a brilliant sheen of poetry to the Bohemian story and had taken the unwieldy Sardou play, La Tosca, and turned it into something both lyrical and compelling. In the midst of all the letters passing between Puccini and his librettists and the trouble they found behind every scene and verse, a terrible accident befell the composer. In February 1903, while he and the others were working hard on the creation of Butterfly, Puccini and his wife Elvira were being driven by their chauffeur in the area of the composer's home in Lucca. The car swerved suddenly off the narrow, steep road and plunged headlong into a tree. Puccini was thrown under the car and was nearly killed by the impact. A badly mangled and fractured right leg and the coincidental diagnosis of diabetes put him out of commission for some months and he entered a period of depression that nearly derailed the Butterfly Project. We have Puccini's publisher, Giulio Ricordi, to thank for inspiring the composer to come back to Butterfly and turn his whole attention to the completion of the composition 
and its orchestration. Incidentally, we have Ricordi to thank for bringing Verdi back from his occasional doldrums as well. But after much peril, argument, and conflict, the score of Butterfly was completed finally on December 27, 1903, a mere month and a half before the scheduled premiere of the work at La Scala in Milan. The story of the premiere of Madama Butterfly is the story of one of the greatest operatic fiascos in history. Since Puccini had only just finished the score, the opera was delivered in pieces to the assembled cast, who had to learn their parts from the publisher's proofs rather than from a typical piano vocal score. In order not to lose any of the proofs, the publisher, Ricordi, demanded that none of the music leave the theater, which must have been very difficult on the singers, and that all the rehearsals were to be closed private affairs. It antagonized the press and galvanized a vocal minority of people who supported other composers to do their best to disrupt the first performance. So what happened on that fateful night of February 17th, 1904? Well, attentive listeners who recognized a snippet of La Boheme, or at least thought they did at Butterfly's entrance, began shouting, Boheme, Boheme. This was heard all the way through the auditorium. Cat calls and shouts for silence followed, but the performance continued. Even after the exquisite love duet at the end of Act One, only tepid applause greeted the singers. During the lengthy second act, things went from bad to worse. In fact, the bedlam in the audience had gotten to such a point that the singers could barely hear the orchestra over the din. When the mechanical bird calls went into use during the intermezzo signaling Butterfly's vigil, the audience added animal calls of their own, hooting, growling, and howling throughout the rest of the performance. Many revisions were to follow the Butterfly score, but a scant three months after the La Scala premiere, the opera was performed in Brescia, where it was an instant success. The creative team was very much the same as that in Milan, but the composer's attention to compositional and production details seemed to make all the difference, and from that time onward, Butterfly has claimed one triumph after another. Lieutenant Benjamin Franklin Pinkerton, on tour of duty in Japan, has made arrangements through the marriage broker Goro to marry a 15-year-old geisha, Chocho-san. The American consul, Sharpless, warns Pinkerton to be careful of the girl's feelings, that she may be very sincere in her love, whereas the young officer is merely looking to stave off loneliness while he's in the country. Chocho-san arrives, accompanied by her family and friends. And after some discussion of her background, it is obvious that she's taking the marriage very seriously, even to the point of taking religious instruction at the mission. The family and friends renounce her, but after they've left, she continues to speak of her love and devotion to Pinkerton. The first act ends with a passionate love duet, after which he draws her into the house. Three years pass, with Pinkerton having gone back to the United States. Chocho-san's maid realistically tries to convince her that Pinkerton will never return, but she continues to wait for him, and in the aria Un Bel Di, she describes how he will climb the hill from the harbor and discover her awaiting him. The marriage broker attempts to connect her with other suitors, including Prince Yamadori, who comes calling. But according to her, she is already married. The consul, Sharpless, arrives with a letter in his pocket from Pinkerton, but she keeps interrupting his reading of it. He finally asks her what she would do if he never returned. She answers that she would either become a geisha again or die. 
As to why she won't accept Yamadori's proposal, she runs out and returns with Pinkerton's son. She calls the child Trouble. When he returns to her, the child's name will be changed to Joy. Sharpless knows that Pinkerton's ship is indeed about to enter the harbor. A cannon shot is heard, and through her spyglass she sees that it is the Abraham Lincoln, Pinkerton's ship. She and her maid, Suzuki, and the child hold vigil all night, waiting for Pinkerton to return. Early the next morning, as Chocho-san takes trouble to a bedroom to sleep, Suzuki sees Sharpless and an American woman in the garden. She soon discovers to her horror that it's Pinkerton's American wife, Kate, and they are there to collect the child and take him back to the United States. Pinkerton arrives as well, and seeing the house completely unchanged from the time before, is filled with remorse over his insensitivity. He runs out of the house, leaving Sharpless and his wife to deal with Chocho-san. When she returns, at first she thinks her husband is hiding from her, but she soon puts the pieces of the puzzle together and realizes that she waited in vain for him. With great dignity, she tells Sharpless and Mrs. Pinkerton to come back in a half hour, at which time she will hand over the child. As soon as they leave, she breaks down in tears, orders Suzuki to care for the child, and prepares her ritual suicide with the dagger that her father used for the same purpose. On the dagger is the inscription, it is better to die with honor than to live without honor. Hoping to stop the suicide, Suzuki pushes the child into the room, but Chocho-san is undeterred. She bids farewell, gives the child an American flag to wave, blindfolds him, and then steps behind a screen and commits harikiri. I've invited Dr. Karen Smith, the Senior Curator of Asian Art at the San Diego Museum of Art, to join me and talk about the Geisha Society, Samurai Society, Japanese Society in general, and the art that is reflected uh, in that uh, society. Karen, welcome to Opera Talk. Nice to it's be here. Good to have you here. In the libretto, we know that Chocho-san comes from a wealthy family, a samurai family. Her father, for, for whatever reason, we don't know, it's, it's kept very mysterious has been directed by the Mikado to commit harakiri, and he passes the sword on to um, Chocho-san when he dies. This leaves the family penniless, and she becomes a geisha. Tell us a little bit about uh, the geisha society, the samurai, and perhaps a little bit about the art. Well, that was a common route for women to find themselves uh, in the service. Um, that is, their family came upon difficult times, and they were out, in many cases, saving their family's uh, livelihood, making their family's livelihood for them. Uh, in the case of Chocho-san, it's interesting because she was offered as a bride, if only in terms of preserving her own sense of dignity in this arrangement, mm -hmm. uh, because we do know that she could be divorced, so to speak, at the end of a month, uh, like the rent uh, mm -hmm. or the rent of the house. So this so, is in fact tr true. This based based on on fact. Well, it, the period of this uh, opera is a particularly interesting time. Geisha society, as a sort of high life uh, of Tokyo of Edo, had declined by this period after the Meiji Restoration. Mm -hmm. So that the circumstances for women now were a little bit more. Um, more difficult, and they were imbued with a sense of the West. I mean, the West was very much a part of Japanese thinking during this period. So that's another way in which she's a very uh, uh, a person describing her time. Even though we we love to bash Madame Butterfly for its uh, Western perspective and its view of women as passive and uh, able to be. Uh, uh, kind of dealt with as imperiously as any Westerner might deal with a country or a mm. woman or anything else. But in fact, the way in which she's described it has many truths, I think, about how women were aware of Western society. Mm. They were aware of Christianity as a potential alternative to their own Buddhist faith. And they were aware of a kind of place of woman in society that had changed since the times 
of geisha culture in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. Now, does the Japanese art of the period reflect these changes in society? It must, of course. Well, yes, it does. And uh, the heyday of ukiyo-e, which depicted the actresses and the, or the actors who were playing actresses and the geisha of the uh, leisure quarters, the pleasure quarters, was really over by then. But what had happened in Japan was that artists had studied in France, they had learned how to draw figures, uh, they had learned how to draw specifically, and the nude, which had really not been a subject. It had appeared in ukiyo-e with certain artists like Udamaro, but it actually came back with some real understanding of drawing the body, not just placing these gorgeous robes mm -hmm. on a kind of non-existent figure during the period of the early uh, decades of the 20th century. So we have in the museum some wonderful um, some prints from this period. It's called the New Print Movement. And you can see the difference, the, the geisha, that is a woman dressed in a, 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 a robe uh, and g often gazing into a mirror because this was one of the, the kind of perfect ways of being uh, an observer, mm -hmm. uh, a kind of voyeur on this life of a woman, has changed. And the woman is looking right back out at you mm -hmm. instead of into the mirror. That's interesting. I, what's, I think, important, too, is that we don't look at the geisha as merely a prostitute. No. No, very different. Uh, in the sense that she may have taken money for sex, but she also had to uh, provide entertainment, company, sympathy, uh, and if she was really good, she became a kept woman rather than a prostitute. A like man a courtesan. Would, yes. Like Violetta and Trapiata. Absolutely, yeah, uh, some of our favorite women. Right, right. <laughs> uh, and the ideal was really, I don't know, people may have read the Arthur Golden uh, book, Memoirs of a Geisha, which mm -hmm. is a very interesting story about how you progress through the hierarchy of geisha status until you become essentially a woman kept by a single man. And uh, well, not necessarily a single man, but a one man, mm -hmm. he may be yeah. married, uh, but you are essentially kept in the style that you uh, enjoy by a single person. So that's uh, different, again, from prostitution on a kind of seriatim basis. Mm -hmm. So for, for Chocho-san to be offered in marriage by the marriage broker to this young naval lieutenant, was that unusual? Was that considered a step up? or? Yes, I think that would have been to preserve her dignity and to introduce an aura of dignity into uh, the circumstance, probably for her uh, and perhaps even at her own uh, request. Uh, because we know that having been exposed to this life, she realized that so much of what her past was and what her family's past had really gone away. Mm -hmm. And she was part of this new world where American soldiers came in and would take bribes uh, from among Japanese women. So she thought it was for real, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's the tragedy of the story. <laughs> yes. Karen, thank you so much. Appreciate it's it. It's a pleasure. Madama Butterfly has a number of instances of exquisite tone painting simply because the composer has such marvelous opportunities to do so. The text and the locale offer these. And as we've seen in other Puccini operas like La Boheme and Tosca, Puccini takes great advantage of these opportunities. One case in point is how Puccini deals with the vigil of Butterfly and the appearance of Dawn over Nagasaki Harbor. This is in the transition between Acts 2 and 3. Puccini is creating a sonic environment at the end of Act 2 and the beginning of Act 3 within which the denouement can naturally unfold. There is, first of all, something magical about the humming chorus and its connection to the very specific stage directions that Puccini has placed in the score. He says right here in the score, um, Suzuki closes the shoji screen and the night grows darker. Butterfly leads her child to the screen and she makes three little holes in the screen, one for herself, one for Suzuki, and one for the child, and so on and so forth. The music accompanying these actions is not so much specific as it allows for all of the actions to take place in the proper environment. 
Here's the humming chorus. Following that, the opening of Act 3 is rather like a splash of cold water on one's face. thus announcing the awakening day. In line with the touches of atmosphere, there are touches of exoticism found in the orchestral score, attempts by Puccini to include authentic Japanese melodies that are woven into the fabric of the work. Seven of these tunes are outlined in Moscow Karner's wonderful study of Puccini's operas. The first tune is actually, or at least it was at that time, the Japanese national anthem. And in the opera, it announces the imperial commissioner just prior to the wedding ceremony. The song entitled My Prince, logically enough, appears in association with the arrival of Prince Yamadori, one of Madama Butterfly's suitors. Another tune is associated with Suzuki's prayer at the beginning of Act Two. The original Japanese tune actually lies within Suzuki's vocal line. Finally, a tune identified by Karner only as Japanese classical music is the tune used by Puccini to introduce Butterfly's family. It is first sung by Goro, doubled in the bassoons, the violas, and the cellos, and is then used again by Butterfly to describe the history of trouble that has plagued her family. With these atmospheric, exotic, and folk song elements, Puccini creates a world which is not entirely Japanese and not entirely Italian, but thoroughly Puccinian, and it is a world that we as an audience can completely believe in. There is certainly no lack of wonderful resources, books, recordings, and videotapes concerning Madama Butterfly and all of Puccini's operas. Let's start with one of the classic recordings of Butterfly with Maria Callas as Chocho-san 
and her Pinkerton is Nikolai Gedda, all under the direction of Herbert von Karajan. The first complete recording of Madama Butterfly, recorded in 1939, is now available on CD as well. It stars Totti Dal Monte as Chocho San and Beniamino Gilli as the Pinkerton, a really stunning performance. The sound quality is not so good, but the singing is wonderful. Another terrific recording of Madama Butterfly was recorded by Leontine Price. Her uh, Pinkerton was Richard Tucker, all under the direction of Erica Leinsdorf. And finally, a marvelous recording, some say the best modern recording of Butterfly was with Mirella Freni and Luciano Pavarotti, under the direction of Herbert von Karajan, who had a lot of good luck with recordings of this particular opera. There is also a videotape with Mirella Freni as Chocho San, her tenor, her Pinkerton in this particular videotape is, however, not Pavarotti, but the other great tenor, Placido Domingo. This is also a recording done under the direction of Herbert von Karajan. Now, there are all sorts of books. I referred to one of them, a book on Puccini, not only on his life, but on his works by Mosco Karner, important musicologist of the mid-20th century. It's a book that you'll probably find in a library or in a used bookstore. There is also a marvelous collection of articles about each one of Puccini's operas. This is the Puccini Companion by William Weaver. It's a terrific book, and the article on Butterfly is really wonderful. All of these resources give you a marvelous opportunity to get into the world of our Japanese geisha, Chocho-san, and to get to know Madama Butterfly even better than you do now. I've heard a number of people say, I've seen Butterfly so many times, I really don't need to see it again. That's a statement that always astounds me because every time I've seen Butterfly, I've heard or experienced something different in every performance, every production. It's popular because it's a great work of art, and all great works of art have something to offer you each time you experience them. Go find your old favorite recording of Butterfly and listen to it again. Better yet, see it unfold perfectly on stage. I assure you, its beauty will captivate you again. I'm Nick Ravellis. I'll see you at the opera.